Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chloe Cho of Channel News Asia. Great to be here once again. And Hello. look look who I have, Anchor Jane. How is the, everybody? Yeah, he was what? Five years ago, you were 21. You were called the world's most connected person. Wow, that's a big deal. And now you're in now, the business. Now I've got gray hair. <laughs> Born in 1990, already has a couple of companies under his belt. Talk about a lot of brains here, a lot of uh, genes, good genes in your system. Hmm? And now you're in the business of romance. So, so let's kick it how, off with How that. many people here have tried and used Tinder? Don't lie. All right. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. So what's interesting is that this is only tw st statistics from 2014. A billion swipes. I don't know whether you're swiping to the right or the left, but it's a billion swipes per day and 26 million matchups. That is phenomenal. It's, uh, it's been really amazing. And now granted, it's actually just five, six months ago, I was on this stage in Dublin. And this is, I think, my lucky little spot because six months ago after giving this talk and I was, when I was CEO of Human, it was the next day that Sean, the CEO of Tinder, actually approached us about the acquisition. So, and you're not revealing the price, right? Uh, huh. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so if any of you guys are interested in buying Tinder, tomorrow come find me. So we're talking, our topic is really about the face, the human face of Tinder. Uh, and it struck me, maybe call me old fashioned if you will, but I was just wondering whether with all these dating apps, we've evolved a lot since, I don't know, maybe of you might remember, we had Craigslist, AOL, you had the chat, uh, chat, chat, chat rooms, and, the, and then you have what, match.com, kiss.com, sure. and here we are swiping to the right, swiping to the left, a billion swipes on a daily basis. I just wonder, aren't we actually losing the human touch? I mean, yeah, whatever yeah. happened to the notion of Romeo rocking <laughs> up to a Juliet, you know, patiently waiting along Come the on. porch balcony and it's professing his love? And Chloe, here we are, if so someone showed up at your backyard at 3 a.m. <laughs> singing you a duet, would you go down and give them a kiss or would you call 911? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Look, I th now granted, I'm a month into my new role as VP of product at Tinder, so I'm, I'm new to this and I'm still catching up, but I think... What's so incredible about what Tinder has accomplished, outside of the fact that all of you guys who lied about not using it actually do use it, is that Tinder actually models the way people behave in the real world, mm. just makes it easier, right? And I think what, what you can credit to its success is that so much of the human relationship comes after this one awkward moment mm. where you have to go and approach somebody and hope that they're interested in talking to you and can you facilitate that connection without being rejected. And, and so, so many meaningful relationships have been missed prior to the invention of Tinder. So let me try to uh, understand how this wizard, this wizard mind works. So, I mean, you, you know, you don't, you can't work up the work courage to rock up to a lady and ask her out. So you come up with these devices, knock, knock, right? The other person has to knock back. But So you got human, which puts context in all of your gazillion connections, and yeah. you've got knock knock, right? You've got big, big people who are yeah. supporting you, Sir Richard Branson, <laughs> Will I Am, actress Sophia Bush. So ultimately, how do these things add the human element into Tinder? Right, so look, I'll take a step back. How many people here have started a consumer product company in this audience? Okay, so a handful of you guys. I think the key to a lot of consumer products, again, is taking existing human behavior mm. and making it seamless to scale using technology. It's not about changing behavior. Mm. And so when you look at what we did with Human, which was my prior company, we looked at the problem of how we manage relationships. And when you think about all the people in your network, your friends, your business contacts, your colleagues, we don't remember them alphabetically, right? The most important person in my life isn't Aaron, just because his name starts with AA, sorry Aaron, right? It's the people that I know, because I remember you as the person I met yesterday mm. here in, in Hong Kong, or that girl that I met in New York when I was out three weeks ago, right? And that's the way our brains naturally remember the people, contextually. And so with human, we were simply solving that problem of automatically capturing that context for people and storing it in your contacts so suddenly your contacts reflected the way your brain naturally thinks. 
And with Tinder, it's a very much a similar philosophy. Mm. It's that we all want to meet people, and it's not about being scared or not scared. It's that, look, sometimes you're just busy, and I don't want to be rude and interrupt you. Can I be really blunt for a second? Hit me. So uh, how does Tinder get rid of this uh, reputation of being sorry, the hookup website? Look, it's not, it, people use Tinder right now around the world to meet people in the real world. We're the largest social network in the world for meeting people in real life. So when you talk about the human touch, don't forget, every other network out there, all your interactions are digital. You're sending messages and stickers. I mean, that, talk about the human touch. I mean, like my smiley face is better in real life than it is in an emoji. <laughs> and so when you think about Tinder, we're actually facilitating real world connections. Mm. Um, and so actually, I think when you look at you know, people in this room, I mean, it's starting companies like Tinder, like human, like others, is obviously a bunch of, it, there's a piece of luck involved. Mm. But a lot of it is thinking about existing human problems, existing industry problems in a new way. Um, and so I think maybe even talking about some of the stuff that we've seen with Kairos and the space exploration, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating opportunity right now for people all over the world to go disrupt big industries with fairly straightforward innovation. Yeah, I want to get to Kairos, and I also, also want to get to your uh, Moon Express, the space project, yes. that was, which is completely out of this world. But first, before we move on, I'd like to talk about at least a little bit of your vision. I know that there are yeah. things you can't reveal right now <laughs> in light of your position, your new position at Tinder. But it, with Human, with Knock Knock getting incorporated into the Tinder brand, the Tinder yeah. uh, business model, um, at least can you share how the vision, the business business of romance will continue to evolve? Look, it's more than romance, and that's the beauty of what Tinder is, right? Tinder literally was named because the spark of human connection, right? The Tinder that creates the flame, and I know that's a little cheesy and corny, <laughs> but like, if you go back and you think about relationships, mm. we're all here just as much as to see, the, you know, us on stage, which, sorry, it's, it's more to spend time meeting new people, building these relationships with people from all over the world. And I think the vision for Tinder from day one has been and will continue to be helping people meet in the real world. And today we do that really well for dating. We're gonna continue to do that for dating. And we're thinking about all the other ways we can facilitate those relationships as part of our strategy. So ultimately, is it safe to say that the dating websites as we know it, uh, we are continuing to evolve from when internet used to be, you know, web 1.0, when everything used to be in alphabetical order. Remember back in the days with Yahoo? And then ultimately, we continue to evolve uh, and adapt to our behavioral patterns. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the dirty little secret of Silicon Valley is that there's rarely a new breakthrough innovation. Mm. Right? Every new company is just a rethinking of the same human behavior for a new technology platform, right? a new user interface, a new experience. And so it's not that Tinder is the first in dating, it's not that Facebook was the first in social networking, or that you know, an iPhone was the first touchscreen phone. I mean, the innovation, these, especially in the consumer space, really comes from just thinking about the basic behaviors. But just out of the box. Culture. Which is why I like your thinking. Yeah. Uh, earlier when uh, uh, we were having a chat, you were telling me that it's actually yeah. the non-experts who are right. able to disrupt. So tell us more about Cairo. <laughs> so you developed this uh, young community for college graduates who, are, who can disrupt, who can innovate. Tell us about some of the yeah. projects that the Cairo Society has been able to achieve so far. So, you have big backers on the board. Yeah, so to give you some, some context, uh, in 2008, right as Wall Street was crashing, we saw an opportunity for the best and brightest of this next generation of leaders around the world, these engineers, science, business design students, many of you in this room, to refocus away from just doing PowerPoints and spreadsheets in a banking or consulting job and actually go out and tackle some of the world's biggest problems with entrepreneurship. And so over the last seven years, we've gathered together the top young entrepreneurs with the leaders of today to bring that experienced gray hair with the fresh minds of tomorrow to go and tackle these problems and have launched over 200 companies around the world, right? Our, our community is now, we've incubated and funded everything from uh, Lilly Robotics, which is a new drone company, to Periscope, to you know, the largest biodiesel company in Mexico. I mean, all sorts of industries. These were all companies started by folks under the age of 25. And I think, you know, when you think of a great example of innovation coming from young people, the reality is, 
it's not because we're smarter as young entrepreneurs. It's because we don't know what not to ask. <laughs> and when you don't know what not to ask, you're able to ask the most basic of questions, which often lead to the greatest disruptions. Give and us so, an example. You remember you talked about the tooth, well, toothpaste? So I'll tell, you, I'll, I'll tell you the toothbrush one in a second, but actually, like, an, an, you know, given the time constraint, one cl example close to heart. So my family is now actually working on a space exploration venture called Moon Express. Uh, and so Moon Express is going to be next year, we're sending three rockets to the moon. Um, we'll be the fourth entity in human history to land on the moon. So there's been the US government, the Soviet government, and the Chinese government. Next year, we'll not only be the fourth entity, but the first ever private company to ever land on the moon. It's an autonomous lander. So the question that many people have, well, so what happens on the moon? What's the whole point? And also, can it be a <laughs> business model, a profitable business model? Aren't we, at the there's, end of the day, in, the, in doing this for the sake of well, making part some of, money? Part of the fun of changing the world is that there's a lot of money to make when you change the world. <laughs> uh, but the moon is actually full of Rocks on the moon are iron ore and platinum, right? Asteroids crash in the moon. They, they Does it crumble. matter that we've sort of been in a commodity route and we're kind of starting to recover? You'll, yeah, when we'll, we bring, we'll get there. If yeah, you yeah. want some of the platinum, maybe I'll give you some. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, what's fascinating, though, if you look at the moon as an example of how do you innovate, this is an industry that's traditionally been done by governments, right? NASA, Chinese government, space exploration. Things haven't, for all the brilliant, I mean, rocket scientists literally working on this problem, there hasn't been much innovation. And so what's actually not very well known, but the Chinese lunar lander that landed a few years ago, Jade Rabbit, shortly after landing, its rover actually got stuck in a crater and died. Right? All this effort to land on the moon, and the Jade Rabbit is stuck. So when we started building the lander, all our NASA teams were looking at how do you build the treads and the tracks to get ourselves out of rough environments. But we had actually built the team half with NASA experts, and half with fresh out of college, Caltech, Berkeley, MIT grads. And we asked this young group of people, how should we think about this rover? <laughs> and the question they asked, so obvious and yet had been missed for decades, was why are we building a rover with treads? We're on the moon, there's almost no gravity. And so they just changed it to put little propulsion jets around the lander, and instead of driving, we now hop. <laughs> and so instead of getting stuck in a crater, you just hop. And that simple innovation cut the cost by 80% because you didn't have to build all these fail safes when you just rethink the basic fundamental question. So let me try to speak on behalf of the members of the audience. Number one, would you be a competitor to guys like Elon Musk? <laughs> Number two, when right. does this thing actually take off? So the space market is actually fairly similar to the internet industry. Right? No, no coincidence that a lot of internet folks are in the industry. And so if you look at how the internet foundation was built, you had at the very base level, you had fiber connecting all the major like, points of the world. From there, you had companies come in and build what they call the last mile solution. This is getting from the fiber to the household. And from the household, you then built the application layers, which were things like AOL, Yahoo, et cetera. In the space race, it's very similar. The fundamental infrastructure for anything to work is Earth to orbit. It's the most expensive part of the equation, but getting out of Earth's gravitational field and into orbit is the fiber. We're building the last mile solution. Once you're in orbit, how do you get to the moon? How do you get to Mars and back? Mm. And then you have the applications that come on top of that. And we're only gonna be teasing some of that we're actually going out, we have, I mean, obviously mining is one application layer of going back and forth, but just as much as we're selling, in our first expedition, we're gonna let people send up their fingerprints, their handprints and footprints, and we'll stamp it onto the moon for you, right? Um, which will last forever because there's no atmosphere and wind to blow it away. Right. So as much as we are talking in stratospheric ter terms, <laughs> I wonder, um, do you, was it helpful to you that your father, Naveen Jain, who is also a well-established man in the tech world, uh, info space, yeah. currently Intellius, at the height of the dot-com bust, his company's, uh, his company's stock lost, what, 98% of its value? Went from, what, 136 bucks to about, was it $1.56? When something like that happens to you and you see it firsthand, does that at least give, keep you a li little bit grounded? Well, Knowing that there are consequences, there are costs involved sure. in taking big, big risks. So, the, the beauty of, I mean, 
when you're starting a company, right, it's not easy. Right? Everybody loves, especially recently, entrepreneurship. Being an entrepreneur has become this like sexy term. Like, what do you do? I'm a founder. <laughs> It's more than anything, it, beca it means I'm like unemployed. Right? <laughs> so when most people tell you you're a founder, it means they couldn't get a job or they're crazy enough to do something big. But the fact is, if you're going to be a founder, you have to have something you're so passionate about that no matter what, through the ups, the downs, you're willing to build. So Infospace went from zero to 40 billion. It's still a multi-billion dollar company. But as the industry goes up and down, you have to be able to weather that. And that's something that's so hard and you forget because typically the founder cycle starts off so great and everything is good and there's no wrong you can do. But the minute you start getting traction, things start getting hard. And that's when it matters most to know why you were in it in the first place. Because in the same day you're going to wake up on top of the world and hours later you're on the brink of failure. And it takes a certain type of crazy and a certain type of passion to want to stick through that. And so, yeah, growing up in that environment, you realize this isn't something you just do for the sake of doing. You don't just start a company for the sake of starting a company. Mm. Right? It has to be something that's worth it. Do you feel that what you're doing now is totally worth it? You started your first website when you were in seventh grade. That's about 13. <laughs> Did you know that you'd be talking about the Moon Express, this... <sighs> project out of this world. No, I mean, at that point, I was just trying to get some spending cash to go out in middle school. But <laughs> there's, again, startup is not a job. It's a lifestyle, right? I really believe that at a young age, like most people in this room, you are at the optimal time to build a company. You have very little commitment and responsibility to others. You're fresh out of university or school, so you have a new perspective you can bring to the industry. People want to help you, and you're, w you're willing to put everything into it, right? You have you've very li the least amount to lose at any stage of your career, but that doesn't mean you should do it, mm. right? It's just because you can doesn't mean you should. And so I think uh, we, have, we have a minute left. I'll end with one story, which is the, John the toothbrush story that I promised you, which I think- From the Cairo Society. Which I think conveys the value of young entrepreneurs and innovators. And so, a few years ago, we teamed up with Johnson & Johnson to say, can we rethink a market as big as oral hygiene? Right? A market that hasn't been disrupted in ages. And so what we did is we laid out the problem with experts very carefully, and we said something crazy in the market. We said, why don't we get people who have never done oral hygiene to come solve this problem? Everyone thought we were crazy. And when we brought everybody in, Keep in mind, the market up until now, I'm sure you guys have all seen the latest oral hygiene is toothbrushes with 50 bristles, ultrasonic, up and down, round and round. It's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. And the first question that these young entrepreneurs asked when given this problem was, why are we building a toothbrush? That question hadn't once been asked in all of the research into this space. And it turns out we've been using the toothbrush since ancient Egypt when they had wooden stick with bristles to clean their teeth after 2,000 years of innovation has led you to the Sonicare toothbrush. And what they found was that when you knew it was causing gum disease and you built a liquid solution like Listerine to target those bacteria, we can actually treat oral disease better than brushing your teeth twice a day. And that solution is in stage three right now of FDA trials in the US. Right? All right, excellent so, anyways, stuff. Thanks for having me, guys. But you know, Anchor John, he's only 26, and imagine uh, what he's going to turn into 10 years from now when you're old, when you're 36. More gray. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Chloe.